Very uplifting message, wasn't it? It's good when men can handle topics like this with skill. It's a great shame that there's so much squabbling about this subject in our day. Various, various forms of it, they argue about, well, who did the choosing? Did God choose or did we choose? So they argue about when the choice was made. Was it made before or was it made like when I decided to come in? Some even argue about why the choice was made. But such controversies have to be cast down. The Lord has not called us to be spiritual simpletons. But rather, he would have us be wise and rise up higher so that you can get an accurate perspective of these things. So that's what this has kind of been for you as a call. It's, it's been a rise to a, a higher level so you can get a proper and accurate view so that you can make a proper discernment to get, to get the right idea when we hear about it spoken. We've seen here that God chooses, when God chooses anyone, that it's for a purpose. And surely this is true about Israel. I'll take you to Deuteronomy here, chapter 7. Read what God said about his chosen people, Israel. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, saying, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people. If you were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he hath sworn to your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of the bombing from the hand of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Now you ask me, that's pretty precise. I didn't choose you because of who you were. And he's also precise about their fathers as well. I didn't choose you because of something your fathers did but something I swore to yeah. your fathers, something I said that I would do, a purpose I declared, a purpose that or it had its origin with me. That's why I have chosen you and favored you. And surely this, this same truth is true of us. Mm -hmm. We are chosen for a purpose, something mm -hmm. God purposed. Right. Now we're just going to take you to First Peter here, some descriptions of the saints here. We're described as lively stones, First Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer the spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now, two things that stick out there. What kind of stones? And it says built up a spiritual house. Who does the building? That's something you have to take into consideration. But it's a special stone. And a stone was made for building. You're like part of a divine project, so to speak. Something God is doing. You're part of that. Same chapter, down in verses 9 and 10. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now a people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Now, see, there's the result. Like, what's the purpose? Why are you peculiar? Why are you chosen generations? At that, you bring forth praises. That's, right. That's the purpose. And also, it brings that, like, you weren't a people before, so this obviously isn't because of what you were before. You weren't always favored. And they're also told that we're, in Ephesians 1, 4, it says, we're chosen to be holy and without blame before him in love. That's another thing. And in Romans chapter 8, a very well-known text in our midst, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that we might be the first, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, them he called, he also justified, and them he justified, them he also glorified. So this is what God has said about his chosen. This is what he's doing with them. You kind of have that picture there. So with this being the case, what then should the exhortation be? I will base this on 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. It says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. Verse 4, the last part would be the part here I'm focusing on. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he might please him who chose him to be a soldier. That's where I'm going to start. Don't entangle yourselves with the affairs of this life. But why? So that you can please the one who chose you to be a soldier. Or as the scriptures affirm, from the beginning, chose you to salvation. That's the object. That's why you're doing this. It doesn't say that you might please him who you chose to fight for, but who chose you, who put you in the battle, who gave you the sword, the shield, the helmet on your head, 
the armor on your chest, everything. It's there because of him. He's protected you. He's made the provision for you. He's given you the strength to make it through the battle. Don't entangle yourselves with the affairs of this life. Now, the fact that you've been chosen, that creates determination as well as confidence. When you realize God has purpose from the start to save you, and you know from and you know what awaits those who are chosen, that will make you all the more able to stand. The idea is not the idea is not to let the things of this life that don't let them distract you. Don't confine yourself to this realm. Do not allow what happens here distract you or draw you away from what's happening there. Yeah. Don't let it happen. With our text in mind, a soldier, he's not going to fight as well if he's absorbed in other things. Yeah. If he says focus is elsewhere, not on the fight, he will most likely fall. But the focus has to be on the fight, but not just on the fight itself, but pleasing the one who chose him. In this case, you fight with the end of the battle in mind, when you're standing before the captain of your salvation, hearing him say the words, well done, good, faithful servant. You made it. You won. That's, like, that's kind of like what's in mind when you're fighting the battle, is what's at the end there. Please him who chose you. Please him who put you where you are, having confidence that he will bring you through. Now, if such determination comes from knowing you are chosen, see, it says, please him who chose you. So, I mean, there, right off the bat, there's some knowledge that you've been chosen. The, the soldier knows he's been put in the battle by God. And so that's what comes with this very fitting word from 2 Peter 1.10, to make your calling and election sure. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're going to please him who chose you, you have to know that you're one of the chosen. Mm -hmm. how, how we have to know that... We're one of the Lord's chosen. That these words will have any avail. If, I mean, if, how can you expect this to benefit anyone if they're not confident that they're one of the people described in these verses? That's where that word comes in. Make your calling and election sure. And that's not just a one-time thing. Yeah. That's a constant thing. That's a lifelong thing. Yeah. Every time we read about what the Lord is doing, every time we read about what the Lord's people are to be, are we fitting that description? What the Lord says will happen to those believed. Is that happening with me? That's, that's a way you could start with that. Kind of grow with that. And as you grow in these things, as you see these things opening up, you see the Lord working in you, you will be able to say, I'm one of the chosen. And have that same determination to fight so that you can please that person who chose you. That one, God. So, as the, the text very fitly concludes, you do these things, you'll never fall. Never fall. We now open for your insights and comments.